On Tech News Today, the FAA says posting drone footage on YouTube is illegal. Plus, Twitter cuts off Meerkat, and BlackBerry gets back into the tablet business. It's all coming up next on Tech News Today. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Tech News Today is provided by CashFly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. It's time for Twit's annual audience survey, and we want to hear from you. Please visit twit.tv slash survey and let us know what you think. It only takes a few minutes, and your anonymous feedback will help us make Twit even better. We thank you so much for your continued support. Twit.tv slash survey. <laughs> This is Tech News Today for Monday, March 16th, 2015. This episode is brought to you by Blue Apron. Blue Apron will send you all the ingredients to cook fresh, delicious meals with simple step-by-step -step instructions right to your door. See what's on the menu this week and get your first two meals free by going to blueapron.com slash twit. That's blueapron.com slash twit. And by Gazelle, the fast and simple way to sell your used gadgets. Find out what your used iPhone, iPad, and other Apple products are worth at gazelle.com. Tech News Today is the show where we talk about the tech news with the journalists who report it. My name is Mike Elgin, and our co-anchor today is CNET Editor-in-Chief Lindsay Turrentine. Welcome to you, Lindsay Turrentine. Good morning. It's great to be here. Not in Austin. You know, we have speakers in the here in the Brick House, and those were turned way up, so you were the voice of God there for about three <laughs> seconds. That was impressive. Uh, no, no, that was that was actually kind of cool. Uh, anyway, so uh, welcome aboard. I don't know. We were talking a little bit about Meerkat, Meerkat before the show. Um, I'm like an obsessed fan, and you've been watching from the periphery, kind of going, "Wow, this doesn't make any sense." I don't know. I don't know what is your perspective on Meerkatting? I think it's really cool. I like the idea of it. When when I when we first were, I think we were we got a really early email saying, "Hey, check this out. This is new service." thought this is a really neat experiment. It's a neat way for normal people to participate in reporting of all kinds and just hanging out. Um, but I, my frustration with it is that as an observer and as somebody who really just wants to watch other people's streams, I miss them all the time. Constantly like, oh, I want to see that. And then I chime in, it's over. Yes, exactly. That happens all the time. And one of the reasons for that is that people don't do long ones. They do short ones because they think it's Vine or YouTube or something like that. The fact is that in the first 10 seconds when you're doing a meerkat session, nobody's watching. And then like one person shows up and then maybe another and then another. And it takes, you know, 15 minutes or so before you have a quorum of people uh, enough to really, you know, stream. And that's the problem. Like, you know, it goes out on Twitter, there's a delay there, right? So then by the time people actually see the tweet, the thing is over if people are doing too short uh, mm -hmm. are, 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 are sort of streaming too, you know, too short of a time. So a uh, little tip, a pro tip, if you're uh, mere casting, make sure you give it some time. You can't do it for just a few seconds. What's, Our, the op what's your optimal length, Mike? Six is it hours, like <laughs> okay. roughly. No, there is no optimal length. I think that I think you need to be doing it for at least 15 minutes to really have enough people to do it. But, you know, everything, it depends. You know, it's really something for your Twitter followers and the people among those followers who are interested in in Meerkat sessions. It's really not a broad-based, you know, uh, mobile thing. If you're looking at the video version, here's the Meerkasting session we're doing right now. We have 140 or something, which is, you know, a tiny, tiny number considering the number of people who are watching live.twit.tv, for example. And so you're never going to get super huge numbers um, unless you're Leo, who had hundreds, I think, over the weekend when he was uh, Meerkatting um, his various stuff. Uh, here, but uh, yeah, it's not a mass medium. It's a it's a very personal medium, actually, and you can do long sort of what I call ambient sessions, where the camera's just rolling. You're not you don't have to be talking the whole time. You don't have to be doing something the whole time. You can just you know have it running and bring in whoever wants to participate in whatever it is you're doing. It's kind of a cool medium, and we'll see where it goes. It might be dead in two weeks. Who knows? All right. Well, let's jump into the news. Is it illegal? for Americans to post drone footage on YouTube. The FAA, FAA, the Federal Aviation Administration, sent a legal notice to a drone enthusiast named Jason Haynes, informing him that he was breaking the law. The reason is that because YouTube is monetized through advertising, any drone footage indicates the flying of the drone in the first place was a commercial use of drones which currently requires special permission. We learned about this story from a feature on Motherboard by Jason Kebler. Uh, welcome to you, Jason. Hey, how you doing? 
I'm doing great, thank you. Now, I assume that hundreds or thousands of drone videos are posted on YouTube every single day. Why was Jason Haynes called out by the FAA? So I think Jason was probably called out because he was flying a bit unsafe. Uh, he was flying above a lot of people um, and that sort of thing. So basically what happened was the FAA sent him a letter from a safety inspector saying that his videos had been monetized, which is illegal according to the FAA. You can kind of get into semantics there about whether a court would agree with that or not, whether there are actually regulations. But what happened was they said, hey, you're operating commercially. Uh, you can't do this. So he says that he himself has never gotten any money from posting these videos on YouTube do you think that the FAA is essentially using a loophole or, I mean, th their letters seemed pretty clear. Like we took a serious look at your website. There's advertising on it. We feel that this is commercial. Do you think that that's a ruse or do you think that they really are trying to keep people from flying <laughs> under the radar, so to speak, with commercial operations? Right. That, that's why this is so problematic. Um, it's been a smokescreen, this idea of commercial flight versus hobby flight being inherently subject to more regulations. Um, what happened here was this guy is not a commercial operator whatsoever. He does what lots of other people do. He takes videos and then he puts them on YouTube and he happened to turn on advertising. The problem here is the video is already taken. Um, the flight is done. There's no safety risk afterwards after the fact of turning on advertising or not. And there's huge kind of like first amendment implications on if you're going to, you know, if you're going to start saying when and who can make money off of certain videos. So I think that's why it kind of struck a chord with a lot of people. Um, saw a lot of reporting saying the FAA is saying you have to take down videos on YouTube and that sort of thing. That's not what's happening. It's, it's I think, maybe a mistake by the FAA to go after this guy because there are such uh, huge implications. But they should have, if it was a safety concern, they should have made that clear from the get-go um, and not mention the commercial use whatsoever. Now, you talk to the FAA. What do they tell you? So it's very hard to get clear answers from the FAA, but surprisingly this time they said they're going to investigate it, the, their D.C. headquarters. And what that kind of signals to me, I, I'm, I'm certainly uh, speculating here, but I've dealt with them a lot, and usually the answer is no comment. Um, we don't want to talk about it. Uh, the answer here was we're investigating, which I think what may have happened was a regional safety inspector uh, basically, I don't want to say overstepped his bounds, but perhaps uh, used the wrong language in, in a letter here saying, you know, there's commercial uh, concern with you posting on YouTube, um, which, as, you know, as I mentioned, you can Bye. identify thousands of other people. Um so I think they're going to look into it, and I don't know if they're going to come out with a statement or not, but I, I would imagine that this will end soon, and they'll say, you know, you can post things on YouTube. Looks like, yeah, it looks like we uh, lost Lindsay temporarily. We're going to Skype her back, uh, and thank you, Skype. Uh, they do it to us every single episode. All right, you're back, Lindsay. Uh, go ahead. You had a question, I believe. And um, So... I'm curious about the, the issues surrounding the privacy of the folks who are in the shot, right? If he's making money from this at all, my question is, does he need to be getting permission from the people who are showing up essentially as extras in these, in these flights? And I know that they're not super commercial, they're hobbyists, but yet I can see if you are standing on that beach, you're getting caught up in this, it, it might be something concerning, Right. I mean, it's certainly a concern, but, uh, you know, there's no, lots of people take photos, you know, in public spaces with DSLR cameras or with, you know, their cell phones and then make money off of it. Whether they actually blur someone's face or not um, is kind of beside the point uh, in a lot of cases, at least. I mean, obviously you have to sign a release if you're going to be used in like a commercial and, and you're kind of informed, hey, we might be filming here or what have you. But uh, in this case, there, there's certainly privacy concerns, but I don't think that, that this is really privacy related at all. What kind of fines is Jason facing if the FAA is really serious and if he doesn't comply with whatever it is they're asking him to comply with? Well, in the past, the FAA tried to fine a guy named Raphael Perker $10,000. 
Um, that case was eventually settled out of court for about $2,000, I believe. Uh, and that was after a very long uh, legal process, a very uh, kind of frustrating one for, for the FAA because there was a period there where uh, precedent was set where all commercial flights were legal that uh, they didn't really enjoy. But uh, I wouldn't expect them to, to proceed here because, uh, as I mentioned, there's serious First Amendment uh, implications, and I think it's a fight the FAA doesn't want to, to, to fight. Well, whatever you do, uh, folks out there in Twitland, don't tell Padre about this. Uh, he is the quad father, and he is uh, not going to be happy about this news. Um, so uh, it's our little secret, okay? Jason Kebler is at motherboard.vice.com, and you can follow him on Twitter at Jason Kebler. Thank you so much for joining us today, Jason. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. All right. Got a lot more news coming up, but first let's talk about Blue Apron, one of our sponsors today. Blue Apron uh, is a subscription meal service. Now, they don't make the meals, you make the meals, and that's the best part as far as I'm concerned. Uh, they send you a big box. Uh, for example, I have the uh, the weekly uh, uh, meals for two uh, package, and so three times a week, uh, or once a week, I get a, I get a box, and in it is three meals. And also, there's a card for each meal. And on that card is a big, bright, beautiful photograph of the meal as it should appear when you're done. A list of all the ingredients. So you pull those out of the box when you're going to make one of these. And then on the other side of the card is step-by-step -step instructions about how to prepare this meal. They give you exactly the ingredients that you need. Oftentimes, some of these meals are very kind of exotic. They're some very obscure uh, Asian or Indian or African or Mexican uh, meals that where they have ingredients you're unlikely to find at your local supermarket, but they'll provide those so you don't have to have them on hand. It's really a fantastic thing. Now, this is better than restaurant quality food. Every single meal I've had on Blue Apron has been fantastic, and it costs less than $10 per meal. Try getting a great meal at a restaurant for under $10 per person per meal. It can't be done. Every meal is between 500 and 700 calories, so you're not going to be overeating with this, but it's real food, so you're going to be satisfied uh, with what you're eating uh, at Blue Apron. Uh, so many great meals. I've, I've uh, had so much fun with this, and of course, as I've said uh, before in this show, my wife is a great cook, and because she's such a great cook, and because she has such high standards for food, she ends up doing all the cooking, and that's that's not right. With Blue Apron, I can give her a break. I can make a meal that she'll like uh, and, and give her a break. So it's a really great uh, uh, service for that reason alone. And of course, if you go to Airbnb or you stay in places where they have their own kitchen, you can just bring the Blue Apron stuff with you and you have everything you need to cook even when you're away from home. Blue Apron is a better way to cook. Just check out this week's menu and get your first two meals free by going to blueapron.com slash twit. That's right. Two free meals just by going to blueapron.com slash twit. And we thank Blue Apron for their support of Tech News Today. Well, Meerkat is exploding in usage right now. The live streaming app had an epic weekend thanks to heavy use by attendees of South by Southwest in Austin, Texas, and also by Twit people in Petaluma and also Africa. As of this morning, four <laughs> of the top 12 users were Twit staffers or hosts, including Leo, of course, Alex Lindsay, Jeff Needles, and me. Meerkat depends entirely upon Twitter for the social graph. Initially, you would follow people on Meerkat by following them on Twitter, and also the comments uh, are basically replies on Twitter. And that's why it's significant that Twitter over the weekend disconnected Meerkat's connection to the Twitter social graph. That means new users will not automatically be connected to their Twitter connections, as was the case in the first few weeks of the service. Twitter's action against Meerkat comes in the wake of Twitter buying a Meerkat competitor called Periscope. This seems pretty cut and dried to me, uh, Lindsay Turrentine. They don't want, uh, you know, they fear that Meerkat will explode and continue to grow and they'll figure out some way to monetize and they'll make a ton of money off the, the, the Twitter social graph and Twitter won't be cut into the deal and Twitter doesn't like that. Yeah, you know, what's so interesting to me is how quickly this happened. Periscope is not very old. It's just a few weeks old and presumably Twitter's Periscope deal was in the works for a while before that. And I'm, it's just, it makes you wonder how much did Twitter know about Meerkat before it happened? Was it a surprise? Was it already planning at something very similar? And they're sitting back in, in meeting rooms going, oh my gosh, I can't believe somebody else pulled this off first. It's really, I, I really, I hope somebody digs up the backstory there. I do too. I mean, who knows what Twitter's capable of? I mean, sometimes they buy uh, sites like Vine 
and they integrate it or they can continue to use it. And, it, you know, if you're a Vine user, no problem that Twitter bought it because you can still do Vines. In other cases like Posterous, which I was a big fan of, used to be a social, uh, very uh, amazing, actually, kind of a blog platform. They bought it and just smothered it. They just killed it. And just to get it out of the picture because they thought it might be some kind of competitor to Twitter. And so I hope that, um, you know, in this case, it appears because they're they're pushing back with Meerkat, they're probably going to build um, the functionality of Periscope, which, by the way, has not shipped yet. If you've never heard of Periscope, that's because it doesn't exist yet. They're working on it. Uh, you know, it, let's hope that Twitter builds Periscope-like functionality into Twitter, and let's also hope that they won't completely cut uh, Meerkat off. Now, of course, the, the Meerkat CEO, Ben Rubin, has said that... Um, you know, they're not concerned about uh, Twitter cutting them off. They're going to build their own social network. Uh, and that's yet another reason for Twitter to sort of strangle them in their cradle, so to speak. Yeah, building your own social network is very easy to say and really hard to do. Yeah. And we've seen it happen over and over again, right? Like you and I were both super excited about Ello. <laughs> I, yeah. I, you know, I haven't heard much about Ello yeah. lately, although I get a lot of email from Ello. I guess... You know, it's it's just it's such an interesting time in the in the social network scene generally. It seems very very hard, even for a giant like Google to to crack that nut. So I'll I'll be surprised if Periscope, as cool as it is, doesn't end up being integrated into something bigger that's not Twitter. I'm also I think it's kind of funny, just as a side note, that that <laughs> Meerkat seems to just embrace the vertical video disease right? Yes. People stream vertically. Let's not fight it. I think that's weird and different, kind of interesting. It's it's kind of hard to shoot a good scene vertically. What do you think about that? I think it's really interesting. And I don't really understand where that came from. Uh, YouTube, of course, really demands horizontal shooting. And uh, you can shoot vertically, but it looks terrible on, on YouTube. And I started shooting horizontally when this first came out, when I first started playing with it. And I think it was Leo who said, no, 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 you got to shoot uh, uh, vertically. So I immediately started doing that. And I see that everybody's doing that. But who says you have to? I don't understand. You, If you if you put it uh, horizontally, it works fine. Um, yeah, it, I don't know. Unless it you is, look at it in the browser, in which case it doesn't look fine no matter how you do it. It's kind of, I feel like there's some sort of very subtle message. Just it, It's like the same as with the name Periscope. Meerkat is all about this vertical little animal poking up out of out of its burrow. I feel like there's something going on there. It has to do with the name. Yep, yeah, definitely. Well, in related news, the inevitable has happened. Someone cobbled together something called Meerkat Roulette, which is just what it sounds like. The page lets you cycle through random meerkasting sessions with a click of a button. Go to meerkatroulette.com and see the annoying trend. There it is. Now, if you're looking at the video version, we're clicking through. Seven people are watching Ian, what is it, Waring, who himself is walking down the street in some gloomy district, and then if we click next, we'll see what the next thing is. And, you know, it's Meer Meerkat Roulette. And yeah. there's, Do you remember uh, Chat Roulette? Oh, yes. Do you remember? Yeah, I'm not doing that. I'm not no. going to Meerkat Roulette. No. Never. No, no, okay. I well, don't want to see that. Fair enough. <laughs> anyway, there it is. Oh, some people on stage singing We Are the World or something. Of course, Austin, Texas. What are you going to do? And so, of course, South by Southwest continues until tomorrow. Somebody's in the gym working out. That's nice. All right. Could have been worse. It could have been much worse. That was pretty tame. <laughs> All right. In, in other news, BlackBerry exited the tablet market some time ago, but now they're back. BlackBerry's partnering with IBM and Samsung and leveraging their acquisition last year of the German encryption company SecuSmart to sell a secure tablet. The product is called the Secu Tablet, and it was developed for a German government department. So this is not a broad-based thing yet. Secu Tablet is actually a Samsung Galaxy Tab S 10.5 LTE with software from IBM and SecuSmart. The project started at SecuSmart before BlackBerry acquired it. So this is a case where SecuSmart uh, had this project in the works. They were planning on releasing this, but I think it's kind of interesting that BlackBerry is selling a Samsung tablet. I think it makes a ton of sense. And there are a lot of people and analysts who've been saying for a long time that this is what BlackBerry should do. BlackBerry should go the IBM route. It should license its um, security apparatus, basically, should work with businesses it already has close connections with to bring some of what BlackBerry has to offer, which is largely in the security space, to other platforms and developers. And I think maybe this is just putting their toe in the water. Yeah, we saw a lot of this at uh, Mobile World Congress 
with uh, with companies uh, like Silent Circle releasing a tablet. Their tablet is a seven inch tablet is actually kind of a kooky product because it's actually a phone. It's a seven inch phone. Uh, so that was an interesting decision on their part. Uh, but uh, but yeah, the, the secure tablet uh, world, I think, is uh, ripe for the picking. And I hope that they go more broad based beyond Germany for this uh, particular product. Well, YouTube is reportedly thinking about a subscription video service that would compete directly with Netflix and Hulu. YouTube, which is owned by Google, is reportedly strong-arming potential partners into licensing deals. One variety source said that YouTube gave them an ultimatum. Agree to the terms of subscription service or be excluded from any future ad revenue on YouTube. Ouch. The video that's service. Yeah, that's brutal. The video service and the aggressive licensing tactics apparently are based on what Google did with YouTube's music key service. It, that's rough. And, you know, it's interesting that YouTube is playing such hardball here in such a competitive space. There's so much subscription video service out there right now. The content has to be absolutely amazing. So it seems like it seems like a big gamble to play hardball like that, to be honest. It does. And um, and I wonder what, you know, I imagine that Apple does something similar and Google's trying to do what Apple does. But I think Apple has a somewhat better position because Apple is very, very good at monetizing content. The people who are uh, having their TV shows and movies on Apple TV are, are making money. And uh, the people who have their stuff on YouTube are not yet really making a lot of money. So I think that it, is a, it could be a risky uh, proposition. Uh, but on the other hand, what are their options? I mean, if they play softball, they may not be getting any partners. So um, we'll see if that works out for Google. It's true. And it's possible that, you know, one thing that YouTube has that a lot of the other subscription players don't is those really established YouTube channels that have a lot of followers in the very young demographic. And if they can really corner that and turn some of those into subscriptions, maybe they've got something going on there. I mean, I know that like my son will get up and sneak YouTube time in the middle of the night to follow the channels that he's obsessed with. Yeah. You never know. Maybe there's something there. Yeah. So we'll see where that goes. Well, the Chinese phone giant Xiaomi is partnering with another Chinese company called Leaning to create a line of smart running shoes, of all things. Sensor microprocessors will be inserted in the soles of Leaning running shoes, which will connect to a Xiaomi app for tracking fitness metrics. I'm seeing a lot of news this week about smart shoes, lots of different attempts. Of course, the wearable market is supposed to be a broad-based thing, Lindsay Turrentine, with, of course, smart watches, smart glasses, smart clothes, smart shoes, smart hats, smart whatever. But really, it's all about smart watches so far. Uh, we'll see if the shoe market comes off uh, better than uh, other areas of wearable computing. But, Lindsay, uh, do you think that we're going to reach a sort of peak uh, fitness metrics at some point? I mean, the... the uh, so many devices, so many watches, every device, you know, it relates to fitness. They, they, everything is a pedometer. Everything is a heart rate monitor. You know, what point are there enough already of these products out there? I, you know, I think at some point everything may consolidate to something like a watch. But I, I actually think that what's going to happen is that in five years, we're going to look back at this and say, when did we not have sensors and everything? <laughs> but that sensor technology is going to get so light and so so cheap that we're just going to come to expect it all over the place. But in this, what, what's so interesting about this to me is that we talk a lot about how Xiaomi uses Apple as a, as a, uh, an example and essentially mimics what Apple is doing. But in China, this really, really smells like Apple Nike. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. I mean, it is exactly the same thing, probably the exactly the, exactly the same data play. Um, and, and exactly the kind of, partnership mojo that Apple has gotten for years and years. So to me, this is less about like the exploding internet of things and really more about let's do what Apple did. What I'm curious about is I'm not really aware, and maybe um, those of you watching who do know can can let us know and send us email to TNT at twit.tv, but what is the fitness scene like in China? Do people go jogging? I mean, I hope they don't go jogging in Beijing or Shanghai. The, the air quality is horrible. Um, but is there a big fitness you know, movement in, in, in China? Do people jog there? I mean, that, that's this sort of product would demand that. And of course, it's going to be a China play for the foreseeable future. Uh, let me know. TNT at twit.tv. Well, we got some follow-ups for you. We reported on a rumor that Apple was planning dedicated stores just to sell the Apple Watch. Now there's material evidence of this happening. A store is being built inside a Tokyo luxury department store called Isetan. The store is covered up by a black wall, which says Apple Watch and also coming soon on it. The store opens 
April 10th. This is a uh, this is crazy talk, Lindsay Turrentine. A special store, and like Apple stores aren't enough. They have to have special Apple Watch stores. And I think, by the way, this appears to be selling only the edition version would be my guess. Uh, oh, that's an interesting guess. Uh, I, You know, I am not surprised at all. We know that Tim Cook has been talking a lot about the big push into retail that Apple has been making. You know, I mean, it's retail chief comes from Burberry, Angela Aaron's. She has a lot of experience, presumably working with things like large department stores. And, um, and you know, there's going to be, I think that there's going to be a lot of complexity to fitting people for the watches. So Apple really wants to make that experience posh and seamless and, and appeal to people who might not otherwise go out of their way to go to an Apple store. Yeah, that's absolutely true. Well, in product updates, Yahoo added over the weekend what the company is calling on-demand passwords and what others are calling one-step authentication. The system is less secure than two-step authentication, but more secure than regular passwords, supposedly. With Yahoo's approach, you'll click a Send My Password button, which will send a time-sensitive password generated by Yahoo. The company also unveiled its end-to-end -end email encryption by, at South by Southwest over the weekend. Lindsay Turntine, this is so, sort of making passwords more convenient by essentially cutting the user out of the whole password process. When you click that button, uh, Yahoo generates a password and sends it to Yahoo, I'm not sure how secure that is. If somebody gets their hand on your laptop, they can just generate a password, but you can't reuse that password later on. So if they are no longer using your password later, they can't do it unless it's from that device that's been authenticated. Sounds like a uh, kind of an interesting scheme that will uh, solve the problem of the convenience factor and the ease of use factor without solving the like strong encryption factor. I just... I just... I am I am so for anything that makes this more convenient. I mean, so I am really tech savvy and I spend a lot of my time dealing with passwords and it drives me bananas. Um, but I want something that does this plus like three factor authentication. It has to be secure too. And I'm kind of surprised that Yahoo would pick something that's a little bit of a compromise because Yahoo has had so much trouble with spam and, and so many security issues with mail. So we'll see. Well, but on the other hand, one of the reasons for that is that their user base tends to be the less technical user types. I think the more technical users tend to use Gmail or something like that for some reason. I have no idea why that is. But, you know, Yahoo Mail has been around a long time and they have a lot of legacy users. And so I, I'm, I suspect that if they did something hard, uh, hardly anybody would use it. So they're doing something that's easy, uh, that improves password security uh, without making it super secure. So we'll see. And, and of course, when they get their encryption up and running, uh, that'll be an option for people. Can They can choose to send certain emails as encrypt, you know, end-to-end -end encryption, uh, but not all email. You know, it's, I don't think there's going to be a way, at least for the foreseeable future, to just turn it on for all email because then the recipient then could have a problem. Well, in mergers and acquisitions, Facebook Friday said that they had acquired a nine-year-old company called The Find which makes a social shopping app that offers a personalized shopping experience based on users' social and online buying activity and history. The find will be shut down. Some employees will join Facebook, and the terms were not disclosed. Lindsay Turrentine, uh, I'm not sure what this is all about. It might be just an aqua hire, but uh, clearly uh, one possibility is that we're all going to be shopping on Facebook pretty soon. Well, I mean, Facebook has been probably the most successful social media business in the advertising space in many ways, right? Like I hear a lot of people say Facebook ads kind of work for me. And that that's, I found that to be true also. And so if Facebook can hook into retail a little bit better on the back end, I'm sure it stands to make a fair amount of money. And so it makes sense to me that they would use some of the technology, but obviously not bring that product straight into Facebook. Yeah. Well, Forbes of all companies has acquired a photo sharing app called Camerama. The app enables the private sharing of photos. The acquisition is seen as part of Forbes' attempt to become a broader mobile media company. Huh. Yeah, <laughs> that's what I said. Forbes. Yeah, Forbes, the Forbes magazine people. Yeah, it's very strange. What a world. Uh, well, we got some more news for you coming up in just a sec. But first, let's talk about Gazelle, our other sponsor today. Gazelle uh, wants to sell you a gadget and wants to buy your used gadget. And there's great reasons why you want to do that. I, I'm a big Gazelle fan. I've been using Gazelle for a long time. I've never bought anything from Gazelle yet, but I'm going to. And I'm looking forward to that. They have uh, devices available in two condition categories. One is certified like new. So this is basically, you know, this is a device that 
can't be distinguished from a brand new device. Uh, and of course, um, if you want to buy something and you've got a certain budget, which I think all of us do, you know, okay, I'm going to spend this much on a new phone. Okay, you're going to get a better phone for that amount of money if you buy from Gazelle. And of course, if you want to get a really powerful phone, you can use their uh, certified good category devices, which have some gentle wear, but, uh, but have great great prices. All the devices, whether they're certified like new or certified good, have been put through a rigorous 30-point inspection to ensure that they're fully functional. And of course, certified pre-owned devices are backed by a 30-day risk-free return policy. And of course, as always, you want to sell your used device to Gazelle. If it's sitting around, it's losing value and it's not doing anybody any favors. You want to take the device that you have sitting in the garage or wherever it is and send it to Gazelle. And if you think it's going to be a hassle, Think again, because it's super, super easy. You just go to the site, tell which device it is that you have, indicate its condition, and they'll send you a box. You just throw it in the box, and off it goes, and you get paid, which is really, really convenient. Uh, they'll even wipe your data for free. So if you're not sure if you've got any personal data on there, don't worry about it. Gazelle will take care of it for you. And Gazelle has paid nearly $175 million to more than 1 million customers. So find out what your iPhone's worth. Take a minute and go to gazelle.com to find out. Well, in hiring, firing, and poaching news, Snapchat COO Emily White has left the company. White was a former Instagram executive and a protege of Facebook COO Sheryl Sandberg. So she's going to be leaning into some new job, I assume, sometime soon. I think she's probably a hot property. It, I bet she is. I wonder, I'm so curious about why she left. We'll probably never know. We probably uh, will never know, but it probably had to do with a massive battle that she had with the other leadership there. Uh, she had a she she has a lot of uh, great ideas of her own, and um, you know so who knows? You know she's she's uh, she's been at Instagram, so she's been around the block a few times, and so uh, that would be my guess. Anyway, we well, got some big numbers for you: thirty five thousand fifty one. That's how many requests Facebook got for user data in the second half of two thousand fourteen. A slight rise from the first half of the year. Another big number, 69. That's the percentage of Americans who are not interested in buying an Apple Watch, according to a poll by Reuters and Ipsos. That's the bad news for Apple. The good news is that about 13% of the people who polled who did not own an iPhone would consider buying one in order to use the Apple Watch. So it looks like, Lindsay, if this poll is to be believed, the Apple Watch is actually going to grow the number of people who are using iPhones. Oh, well, it will have to. I mean, if you really want that watch, you ha you obviously have to own an iPhone, and that's coup for Apple. I mean, I, I wonder if it, for the for the purposes of these, this poll, the users were told how much that would cost. That's a big investment <laughs> yeah. to go in on both of those things. Yeah. three forty nine dollars to $17,000, somewhere in that range. Somewhere in that range plus the phone. Exactly. Exactly. Well, in news you can lose, an Australian father experienced the birth of his child last month from nearly 2,500 miles away by means of virtual reality. Jason Lark yet another Jason in this show, had to be away <laughs> on business in a remote mining town called Chinchilla and ha got to be with his wife, Allison, and experienced the birth taking place in Perth, Australia, using Samsung's Gear VR. The multi-camera setup was provided by Samsung. Yes, they turned the birth into a marketing event. But this is cool. Let's take a look at this video if you're watching the video version. So this is what he's seeing. That's good. That's good. It's going to be all right. Anyway, so... Very interesting. Again, this is a publicity stunt. This could indicate what is coming in the future. And of course, I'm sure it's a it's a safe bet that when that baby was born, Samsung had a little tiny set of VR, Gear VR for, for the baby. <laughs> I like the inspirational music. Yes. I wonder if that went along with it. You need that when you're giving birth, I would imagine. Well, Apple Insider posted some nice drone footage, I hope it wasn't illegal, of the Apple Spaceship Campus now under construction. Let's take a look at how they're doing over at the spaceship campus. I love these things. I am so obsessed with the spaceship campus, Lindsay Turntine. So what we're looking at now, see the, those houses you see on the left, which look like pretty expensive condo type things. The, Apple tried to buy that and the owners would not sell at any price. So now they've got apartments on essentially on the campus. This is the underground freeway that you use to get into the parking garage. Lots of stuff on this is underground. This is the big uh, donut shaped central office building that they're um, making huge progress on. And of course, that is a giant pile of dirt. 
from digging <laughs> from digging holes. I can't. See, I so I, my video is turned off coming in. I can only hear your narration of this. Uh -huh. But sound, it's actually my my imagining of it is probably even better yes, than what I'm you're sure, saying. I'm sure it is. So what you see there, that that hole with a weird structure, that is that is to me the most interesting part. That's where all future Apple announcements are going to take place underground. That's right. They're gonna they're gonna drag all the press into an underground bunker, and <laughs> uh, and basically show them things. And what that's going to enable is the it's going to be the end of what happens now, which is that people go and they look at the big posters and banners that are posted at the Moscone Center in San Francisco before an Apple event. And, and people look at those and figure out what Apple's going to announce. Well, now they will have no access before events about anything. And so yeah, I, my, my production brain is going nuts right now. Like, how are we going to run tape out? You, you're <laughs> not getting in and out of the <laughs> You're not. That's right. Those days are over. Yeah, well, it's, a, it's a big deal. Maybe you can meerkat it. Well, our TNT <laughs> fan of the day is Clint Williams in Rocky Mount, North Carolina, who posted these pictures on Twitter. He recently listened to Tech News Today while on a plane and in a car on a trip to Florida. And there he goes. We, got, we have so many people listen to the car. And I listen to Twitch shows in the car, too. So uh, what are you going to do? Well, how do you watch or listen to TNT? Just record a video or take a picture of yourself or your setup and post it on Google Plus, Twitter, or Facebook using the hashtag HowIWatchTNT, and we will find it. Lindsay Turrentine, what the heck are you working on this week? We are, um, we are working on a lot of kind of cool reviews, some of which I can't talk about yet, but oh, come good on, you stuff can in talk. the coming week. Nobody and will I say anything. Say we just did a really deep review of the Pono player. Remember that? Ah, the Neil yes, Young Pono yes. player? Yeah. And we're lining that up with this, with Sony's high-res audio player. And they're just such interesting devices. So come check out those because we took a pretty deep dive. Great. Uh, the, the, that's Neil Young's uh, is backing the Pono player. And there was some controversy because some uh, reviewers found that it had inferior sound to an iPhone running MP3s, but we'll see. We'll see when with the authorities at CNET. Uh, That's right. Come check it out. Real lab. So we'll see how that goes. All right, Lindsay Turntine. Thank you so much, and we'll see you next week. Thanks. See you next week. All right. Well, you can subscribe to Tech News Today on Stitcher, iTunes, YouTube, Feedly, Yahoo, RSS. So many options. Choose your favorite at twittv TNT. You can also watch us live every weekday at 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern, 1800 UTC at live.twit.tv or on the app or browser plugin of your choice, which you can find at twit.tv slash apps. If you're ever in the greater Petaluma area, come on in and watch us live. You can also follow us on Twitter at Tech News Today TV. And you can follow me personally on Meerkat. Of course you can. First, just follow me on Twitter and then find me on Meerkat. I'm not really sure how that works now that Twitter cut them off, but you'll find me somehow. And let us know what's on your mind. Send us email to tnt at twit.tv or call 260-TNT-SHOW. And don't miss Tech News Tonight at 4 p.m. Pacific every single weeknight. And that is the Tech News Today. My name is Mike Elgin. Thank you for tuning in. We'll see you tomorrow. <laughs>